Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this very special episode of Songwriting Simplified with me, Johnny Lipstrom, here at johnnylipstromstudios.co.uk, here in Scotland, capital of the world, galaxy, solar system, universe, and everything else in it. I hope everybody is doing well. Uh, it seems like only yesterday that we were here and <laughs> we're back. So I can't even say, hey, hope you all had a great week so far because I only saw a lot of you last night. So this might slightly be a case of live streaming overkill, certainly in my case, because uh, I'm not used to doing more than two shows in a week. So uh, yeah, this is kind of a little more than I'm used to. Um, <laughs> but yes, Kyle says we're all special. Yes, absolutely every single one of you. As I said last night, every single one of you, you are special. Um, even if you're brand new, even if this is the first time you're checking out my channel, this is the first time maybe you subscribed yesterday. Uh, and if you did, yay to you. Thank you. I appreciate you more than you know, and I appreciate your support, and I hope you stick around. I hope you don't kind of go, yeah, okay, well, the Studio on the 6.2 thing is all over now, you know, let's, let, no, no, no. It'd be really great if you could stick around, because I do have a bunch of other things coming. Um... A lot of it centered around Studio One, of course, but also centered around Studio One Plus because, you know, that's kind of new. It's uh, the new name. We changed the name by deed poll, so it used to be called Persona Sphere, um, but we kind of took it to, you know, Family Court and we changed its name by deed poll, so now it's called Studio One Plus. And that's okay. That's okay indeed. Um, it kind of makes a whole lot of sense, really, to be very honest. We're calling it that, that now. Um, but, uh, so yeah, so we're going to do that. Plus for those of you that like notation, and I know that there are a few of you out there that do like notation and you are using notion, maybe notion six or maybe notion mobile. Uh, I am going to try a little experiment and that is, I'm going to gradually into introduce some short little videos on just a few little tips and tricks and uh, usage ideas for Notion and Notion Mobile, um, mostly focused around Notion Mobile. Um, not that Notion, even though it's got that word mobile after it, don't think that it's kind of lesser than Notion 6. It's not. It's not at all. Um, because here's one of the big differences between Notion 6 and uh, its offspring, if you like, Notion Mobile. Notion 6 is you know, the the uh, the father, Notion Mobile is the new child. Well, the new child uh, is pretty awesome because uh, this one is cross-platform. So Notion Mobile works on your Mac, on your PC, uh, on your iPad, on your iPad Pro, on your, uh, on your Android phone, on your iPhone, on your Galaxy tablet. It works on all of those and it also works on a Chromebook. So uh, that's all pretty exciting, and especially now with Notion Mobile 3.2, you can actually get it from the Galaxy Store. So you don't have to just get it from Google Play. If you are on a Samsung Galaxy device, you can get it straight from the Galaxy Store now. So that's that's uh, one of the big things that we did uh, at Personas with uh, uh, Notion Mobile. So uh, that's pretty cool. So if you're into that kind of thing, as well as all the Studio One goodness that you're going to get and the Studio One Plus goodness that you're going to get because there's, trust me, there's awesome things that are going to come with uh, Studio One Plus and also with Studio One. So whatever happens in Studio One Plus happens in Studio One. So uh, it's going to be pretty awesome. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be great, folks. Um, there's a lot of really, really cool things to look forward to from um wow somebody is just <laughs> spamming me over on instagram i don't know why i will find out later uh <laughs> but it's just like i got like seven notifications from the same person on instagram that's <laughs> weird anyway uh so for those of you but by, by the way for those of you that are into social media you will find me on facebook you'll find me on twitter you'll find me on instagram and you will now as of 40 minutes ago Find me on Threads, which is the new thing from the uh, the Facebook family. I think they call themselves Meta now, which is 
I'm not going to comment on that particularly, but uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, and it's all kind of tied with Instagram. Basically, if you get Instagram, you now have access to threads as well. So I thought, hey, why not? You know, uh, uh, my my uh, my good, very good friend and colleague at Personas, Chris Swaffer, who is the product manager for Notion and for the score editor in Studio One. Um, he is on threads and he just said, hey, I'm on threads. Why don't you come? join me so i was like okay i'll do that uh and of course and personas we we also have a channel there on threads as well where some of the content for instagram and for the youtube channel is also output onto threads as well so if you're on threads go join us there um it'd be good to see you all and you know you can ask me questions and things there as well all right so um uh, enough with the talk <laughs> Um, as, as much as I like talking and kind of a lot of what I, what this show is about is me talking, but since we are talking studio one 6.2 and we're talking studio one plus, uh, we should talk about those two. And maybe we can talk about notion as well. If you guys want to talk about notion, we can do just, just say so in the chat. If you want to talk about notion, uh, we can talk about that a wee bit. Um, but I know that notion is not for everybody. So, um, you know, we're not going to, we're going to try and split our time nice and evenly. So we've got 17 people here. 12 of you have liked this already and we're only like eight minutes in. So you guys are awesome. Thank you. Um, please do keep liking. And also if you are not subscribed and you're just watching, um, but you'd like to say hello and get your name shouted out, then please subscribe to the channel. Give it five minutes and the chat will be open to you. And you can join in the conversation. You can um, meet these fantastic folks who some of them um, have been around uh, my channel and been around my live stream shows since the beginning when I started doing live streams way back. I think in 2017 is when we did show number one, uh, when my internet sucked <laughs> and the quality was so low budget. It was like watching, you know, one of those tiny 1950s black and white TVs. But um, here we are now with super fast internet and uh, multiple monitors and nice lighting and everything. So uh, we've come a long way. So some of the folks here have been around since then. Uh, so please do get to know them. They are fantastic people. And uh, if I miss a question, the guys with the, the um, with the, the blue wrenches will come to your aid. But uh, as I said last night, don't forget to type at Johnny Lips from Studios before you ask your question. I know it's going to rob you of a few of your characters that, that you need to ask your question. I'm sorry about that. But all that does is it helps me pick out questions from the, from your, you know, your wonderful conversations that you're all having amongst yourselves. Um, so I can see what is a question and what's not a question. All right. So. Uh, and then hopefully I don't miss questions because I know I missed at least two questions last night. So if you were here last night and I didn't answer your question, I'm sorry about that. Um, but I, if you don't type the at Johnny Lipson Studios, it, it makes it hard for me to, to find your questions. So please remember to do that if you possibly can. All right, let's go see who's here after all that preamble. Uh, we got the W5 family who are going to catch the replay. I'm very glad you, you folks checked in. I hope you enjoyed the replay. And if you have any follow-up questions, just drop me an email. Um, I do believe I might have an emailed question, by the way, um, from Keith at Radio Tuck from Pit. Uh, I'm maybe going to need your help, Keith, to unpack your question a wee bit, just to kind of understand it a wee bit. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give it a crack. I'm going to give this question a crack. Um, but I may need you to kind of unpack it a wee bit for me. Uh, so we got uh, the W5 I mean, we got Billy Morgan who's been around since day one we've got Kevin's guitar stories here as well we've got John Hawk and we've got Bill Shepard we've got Mike Johnson who is Mr. Fantastic uh, with no computer at the moment but um, we'll get that sorted won't we Mike um, and we got Brett Marler as well and we got Don Oliver um, who is fast becoming a regular here which is awesome and we've got, as I say, we've got Keith from Radio Tuck Trumpet. And we've got Rich Cresswell. 
um, who is a fantastic uh, composer and audio engineer, and he does really, really great stuff with graphics, and he's a pretty darn good educator as well. Um, and he's here also under his other account, which is called Studio One Tuts, uh, which is basically um, all about Studio One tutorials and, and basically curating a library of the best Studio One educational content that there is on the internet. So go support his work there as well, because uh, I'm a big fan of what he's done. Uh, Ambient Dave is here as well. Shorty Beard is here, which is fantastic. Um, I was listening to your song, uh, I think, was it last night on the live stream? I think it was after uh, the Zoom call, the post, the post stream Zoom call. Um, you were doing a cover of a song and, and it sounded fantastic. I'm really looking forward to hearing the vocal on that. Uh, let's see what else we got. We've got... I'm going down. We've got Boris Dancy as well. And we've got Semog Eng as well. And we've got DJ Vu. I love all these names that I'm I'm barely able to remember. <laughs> uh, Ambient Dave is apologizing for not being around last night. He was tucked up in bed. You know what? I probably should have been tucked up in bed because my day last uh, my day yesterday. By the time I actually got into bed, I've been awake for around about twenty one hours. I don't recommend it. Um, when you're a kid, you can do it, but not really now. Uh. You Brett Marler kind of has some kind of Zoom related question. Uh, and I think we, oh, we got Dan Wesley here as well. Dan, good to see you, buddy. Dan uh, is one of the regulars from the Studio One Meetup, which, by the way, happens on the last Friday of every month. The Studio One uh, UK and Ireland Meetup. I host it. It's pretty much like an extension of what we do here, but it's all personas. And I'm, I'm basically representing personas because I work for the company. Um, which is awesome. I love my job. I wouldn't trade it in for anything in the world. I really wouldn't. Um, but yeah, I host that meetup and it's uh, 8 p.m. UK time. Uh, so that's either when it's summertime, it's British summertime or it's GMT in the off season when it's not the summertime. Uh, but yes, yeah, always 8 p.m. and it's always the last Friday of every month. So we are coming up towards that. So please check your diaries, make sure you can clear it and come hang out with us for at least a couple of hours. Uh, we tend to overrun sometimes. In fact, we've done one that lasted eight and a half hours, uh, which at the time was a record for a very long time, for about two years, I think that one stood, until um, uh, until the Illinois meetup did nine hours and 15 minutes, which is mental. <laughs> uh, and so I, I would like to break that at some point, but uh, we'll see. Um, so I'm very glad to have you here, Dan. Absolutely. All right, let's go see what questions we have, because I think we have a couple here. Um, Keith, if you are able to condense your wonderful question that you emailed me down into kind of uh, something a little bit more bite size, I would appreciate that, because I was trying to understand your context, and I couldn't quite understand what you were trying to get at. Um, but I appreciate it nonetheless. So please, if you could do that. Uh, I would appreciate it because I do want to answer your question. All right, so just Bob with the first question. And Keith, we are going to get to your question. Promise. Uh, and he says, with MIDI notes being able to be assigned to modes like Dorian, and when writing notes, can you take previously written MIDI music and apply those and move notes into scales? They, you can, but then the notes won't automatically kind of readjust according to the scale. So for example, if you've recorded something that's not in Dorian mode, and then you bring it into Studio One, and you set the uh, the scale to Dorian mode for whatever key it's in, all that's going to happen is when you try and enter a new note, the new note won't be allowed to be entered on a note that doesn't belong to that scale. Basically, it's like fixing the scale. You shall only use these notes. You shall not use any others. Basically, it's like that. It's like a rule um, that is put in place and Studio One prevents you from trying to enter a note. I will demonstrate this for you because this is actually a pretty nifty little feature. Bear with me just one moment whilst I get a new song open. And 
my computer is kind of going very slow because I have too many things open as usual. So let's go grab a new song and I'm going to get presents in here. And I'm going to go over to the screen so you can now see it because all of you be going, eh, classroom, 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 classroom. Yeah, I know. I was going to change that color and I didn't. There we go. All right, so let's go grab something not like we normally do. Let's <laughs> let's go for an accordion. Why the heck not? My God, that sounds ludicrous. It's it actually sounds really good. <laughs> uh, let's get the webcam on. There we go. All right, so let's see. Let's go double click here to create an event and then we'll just we'll only make it a couple of bars long. I love this garish green. It's not green. All right, so let's go fix the scale. But this time we're going to fix it not to C, but we'll fix it to D. We'll fix it to D Dorian. Now, if I try and enter a note and I try and hit this C sharp, look, it's not going to do it. I'm trying very hard to hit this C sharp and it's not doing it. Uh, I'm trying to hit this. I'm now trying to hit the E flat and it won't do it. It's just putting on straight onto the E. So you'll see, let's get rid of all of that. What you'll notice is that it's actually impossible for me to enter any other notes. So, you know, I can, I think it's shift to do this. Is it shift? Or is it alt? There we go. So just like that, I've entered the Dorian scale. Pretty much. Um, and so you basically cannot enter a wrong note, basically. But if you've already got existing MIDI notes from another song or from a MIDI file that's on your keyboard, for example, and you bring it into Studio One, if you set the scale to D Dorian, those notes are not going to automatically just go ding, 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 and, and set themselves to Dorian mode. Okay. What you will find, especially if you have this note set to scale, is all the right notes will be blue and all the wrong notes will be red. So let's unfix the scale so I can demonstrate what a wrong note looks like. So I'm going to hit Alt again. And drag down a bit. Oops. That's one note I did not want to do. So let's get rid of that one. All right. So now you can see if I uh, drag this up a bit. If I zoom this in. There we go. Now you can see all the blue notes are correct to the D Dorian scale. All the red ones are what you would call wrong notes, or at least that's what they called them in, in the beta guide. They called them wrong notes. I don't think that's co the correct word to use. I think the correct word to use here is these are notes that are outside of the scale. OK, that's a bit more of a mouthful than calling them wrong. But in my opinion, there is no such thing as a wrong note in music. There absolutely isn't. There is no such thing as a wrong note. There are notes that fit and notes that belong and notes that don't fit or don't belong and notes that fit less well than they than they could. You know, it's kind of like a sliding spectrum from fits to definitely does not fit and sounds ugly. But there's no such thing as a wrong note. Um, I think Beethoven was exactly right. Beethoven said. Playing a wrong note is excusable. Playing without passion is unforgivable. He's right in my opinion. So wrong notes, meh, no such thing. It's a musical event that happened. Uh, especially if you're improvising, there is definitely no such thing as a wrong note. There's notes that fit and notes that don't necessarily fit. Or there's a note that you shoot for and you miss. 
And sometimes those notes that you that you shoot for and you miss and you kind of miss hit it and you miss cue it and you and you end up with a different note than you expect. Sometimes those can sound the best notes ever. But that's another subject. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so these ones, these red ones, don't belong. That's kind of where I'm heading with that. So if if we play this now. And <laughs> outside notes. That's the phrase I was looking for. Thank you, Brett. That's exactly. There are inside notes and outside notes. There's no such thing as wrong notes. Yes, Brett. That's that's the phrase I was looking for. Inside note, outside notes, and oftentimes the outside notes are the ones that are the coolest and the most modern sounding and the most hip and awesome sounding. They just sound great. Um. And I, when I'm improvising, I like to find those outside notes. Those are the things I reach for first, rather than notes that are inside. Um, however, if you play outside for too long, you can go so far outside that it, the, the listener's ear is stretched too far and it just doesn't sound good. Um, so you always have to resolve. If you go outside, you have to come back inside. It's like if inside is nice and warm and cozy, occasionally you can go out into the into the cold, into the darkness, but you've got to come back in so you don't freeze to death. There you go. I like that analogy. So, um, so, uh, let's see, whose question was that? That was, uh, Bob's. Um, so yes, they don't automatically conform, but you can fix the scale so that any notes you do enter will conform to a certain scale. So if you are writing a piece that is firmly fixed, in D Dorian, or I don't know, maybe it's Phrygian mode, or maybe it's Mixolydian mode, whatever it is. Um, if you fix to those scales, then um, you can either uh, have this guy checked so that you cannot write in in any way an outside note, or you can just use this this uh, note color scale guide. And so you know when you're playing an outside note because they're red and inside notes are blue. So if you want to use occasional outside notes, then this checking this box is not going to help you because it will limit you to inside notes only. Um, thank you, Brett, for allowing me to use that term. That's kind of what I was trying to get at. But I suppose after uh, last night um, and all day yesterday, I'm kind of maybe I've run out of words. <laughs> But thank you for that. Radio Top Frump, it says, I shall smoke and attempt to condense it. Thank you. I appreciate that, Keith. Uh, let's see. Just Bob says, just curious if MIDI notes previously recorded can be moved into scale notes, blue from red and sound keyboard trails with it. Yeah, it doesn't do that. It's, it's essentially a guide for note input rather than a guide for um, anything else? Uh, let's see. GP Studio Music is here, and he's and and you're a he or a she. I'm not really sure, but you are here, so I'm going to refer to you that way. You are here, and you said there is a macro that allows you to apply the selected scale to the MIDI notes. Yes, there is. You're absolutely right. Uh, DJ Vu says, if I use a MIDI driver and set the scale at which I want to work in Studio One 6.2, does this mean that the DAW will automatically tune my sounds to this scale? Uh, unlikely, for the for the same reason as as discussed. Um, uh, Acadian Serpent is here as well. Awesome. Tony Cordona is here. He says, can these can these notes be called atonal? Not necessarily. Because atonality is a specific uh, uh, context of music. Uh, you can play lots of outside notes and still be working within a tonal system. So your song may well have very, you know. Sorry about that. Let's get the, the regular piano one. You know, that is very, very tonal. That's basic diatonic music. You're, you're talking about pentatonic scales. You're talking about major using that scale or 
because all of those notes will fit. But this, maybe not quite so much. This is the diminished whole tone scale. It is also alternatively, alternatively known as the D flat melodic minor scale, but it's the same notes. Um, but if in the C context, we're talking about it being a C half, uh, C half diminished scale. But anyway, um, so they're not atonal and you're not necessarily playing a atonal music because the context determines what is and is not tonal. So if you're working very strictly in a diatonic system, C, A minor, D minor, G, 16251, then you're playing diatonic major minor music, okay? You may well have lots of outside notes on the top of that, and that's great, but they're not atonal. Atonal would be for there to be no key center, no sense of tonality whatsoever, no sense of standard chord progressions, where, you know, everything is just... 100% chromatic and there's no there's no sense of a key center or a tonal framework then it would be atonal and there is music out there that does that the music of uh, Webernberg Schoenberg those were kind of like the early pioneers of atonal music and uh, Shostakovich and um, Berlioz and people like that and Stockhausen all of those people were all kind of uh, early pioneers of atonal music, and then they developed it into all sorts of other fantastic um, subgenres of that. But it started with that. Uh, there we go. So I hope that, that answers that question. Uh, Dave from Bob's NY is here. Let's go back over here. He says, in regards to Studio One 6.2, independent phasing with stereo track, is it safe to assume that Studio One 32 SX will pick up on that? And will the remote control be able to implement that as well? I believe you asked that question in a comment on the video itself, um, the overview video that I did. And I believe I answered you. I tested it for you. Um, the answer to do with the mixer is that the polarity controls in door mode I have to be very careful how I say this. The polarity controls when on the mixer, when you are in door mode, don't work. Okay, they don't do anything. However, on the Studio One remote, um, there is a way to access those. And yes, the dual uh, uh, locked um, polarity buttons work together as, as it does in Studio One 6.2. Um, I tested that and I actually gave you um, some instructions on how you can access that. Um, and it's going to be hard for me to show because I don't have the iPad hooked up to OBS. So not really going to be able to show that. But yeah, just go back to uh, the comment thread on the Studio One 6.2 overview, overview video and find your question there. And you'll see I, I gave you that detailed answer there for you, Dave. Um, it's a good question, though. Ambient Dave is here. He says, will additional scales be added at a late date? Maybe. I can't speak to future developments for obvious reasons because I'm under a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, so I can't speak to future developments. Uh, Acadian Summit says, what about customization presets on templates? Good question. Customization presets on templates. Okay, so this is available to you. If you go back to the start page and we do the whole create new song thing. So if I open this, uh, if I go back to the standard templates, record and mix. Notice there is this, I did not cover this by the way. There is this apply customization and at the moment it's set to user defined, but you can set it to any one of these options. Now what this means is whatever option you apply here, that song will open with those, with that customization template. So that means if you set it to basic, for example, it means that when you open up Studio One, most um, features and functionality will be hidden from view. They're there. They're, they are always there. But all this does is hide them from view so you cannot access them. 
um, but they are still there inside the program, which is why you can check the boxes, uncheck the boxes, and all of that. You can change the customization once you're in the song if you want. There's one here specifically just for audio editing, and what that does is that when you are in audio editing mode, all the MIDI features and virtual instrument features, all they just all get hidden so that only audio is available to you. Okay, so you still get used, you still get to use plugins, no virtual instruments, no MIDI. Those are all hidden from view, and you can access them. If you set it to minimal, basically it's it's Studio One is stripped to basically a one button record style uh, application. Basically, pretty much everything is stripped away, and you're just left with the bare bones basics very very minimal functionality in studio one some people will prefer that because all they need basically is one channel one record arm button and hit record and go that's what they need to do they're not interested in mixing they're not interested in anything else that's what they want to do they just want to get their song ideas down minimal is a good option for that okay so that's what this is all about. So it means that when you open a song, you can decide what customization is going to be set for that song. It does not apply to every new song you make. It just applies to that one that you create. So if you then create a sub subsequent song, you can change it to complete. You can change it to whatever um, customized uh, thing that you've got. Okay, so if I was to set that to complete, and then if I click on OK, now I have a brand new song open that has every feature and functionality. OK, I'm going to close this one. And I'm going to go back through that whole process again. This time I'm going to do minimal. So if I click on this one and go minimal and then go OK, look what happens to Studio One. <laughs> A lot of the features and functionality at the top here have gone. There's there's no automation available to you. There's just stop, play, record. Not even a metronome is available to you. All right. If you go to the effects tab, you've still got plugins. You can still do that. You have loops and you have files. But notice, no instruments. All right. No virtual instruments. So this is great if all you're doing is just recording an acoustic guitar and a vocal. This is a really, really good option for you. So if I now go and open another new song, after I've created that one, let's go another new one, and I change this one back to complete. Now this song has got everything. All right, so you can have one song that has just the minimal, one song that has the complete, and every which way in between. And you can create your own customization. So if you're really not a MIDI person, so you don't want the, the virtual instruments, you don't want the note editor, you don't want any of that stuff, you can create your own way. You can create your own personal uh, customization profile and you can store it and then you can open Studio One with that profile. That's what the user-defined one is that I've got. I just didn't ever get around to giving it a name. It just, I just called it, it just got called user-defined. But really, I should call it Johnny's Template or something like that. Um, but yeah, so that's how this works. So I'm going to close that one. And I'm going to close that one too. And I'm going to double check which one is this one that is the minimal one. Ah, this one I was testing. Uh, this, was, this was testing an issue earlier today. So I'm going to close that one. I'm going to say nope. And so now we're left with just these ones. All right. So that's how that works. Great question. Great, 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 great question. Uh, Brett Mara says, it's funny to me that you avoided C major for D Dorian. Um, I'm not sure I understand that. Um, because there is actually a C here. I mean, basically, this basically C major is the uh, sorry, D Dorian is the C major scale, but just starting on D. So it's exactly the same notes. I just start on D instead. Phrygian, 
Lydian. Mixed Lydian. Aeolian. Yeah, come on, fingers. And then this weird little sucker. And then you're back. And so those are all the modes. Basically, it's the C major scale, just starting on a different step. Um, and that's it. That's all the that's all the the uh, Gregorian modes of the minor mode are because that's what those ones are. The um, there's a whole set of other modes that are major modes, and they all have like weird things like Locrian flat two, and all sorts of other exotic names as well. Um, like uh, Lydian flat 13 and things like that. Um, they're kind of much more exotic scales. Just Bob says, were there any updates to Ampire, new patches, amps, etc.? No, is the answer. Not in this release. Who knows what will come in the future? Keep your eyes, he says, pointing to his ears, and your ears pointing to his eyes open. Uh, and keep an eye on future updates, and you never know what will come. Because I can't speak to future updates. Marcos, I believe, is in the room. Uh, who I've not seen for a very long time, if he's here. Uh, let's, let's go down. Kevin's guitar story is, uh, is away. He says I'm barbecued. No problem. No problem, Kevin. Have a good night, mate, and uh, enjoy the rest of the show on replay. Can you explain the new crossfade feature? Yes, and I did that in the video, by the way. But essentially, the new crossfade feature, um, and this is the way it was explained to me by the software team okay so I'm just putting that out there so uh, let's close that out let's do that let's just record um, a few things then I'm gonna chop it up so I'm just gonna uh, first thing I'm gonna do is not that I'm gonna mute that and we'll get rid of that and we'll go again so I'm just gonna record myself talking to you guys like I normally do on a Wednesday night or a Sunday night and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna chop this up into wee bits and then we're gonna crossfade the whole lot but um, this is how it was explained to me um, okay so we'll stop now so I'm just gonna record myself talking to you guys like I normally do all right there we go so if I now chop this up in a few random places like that so we've now got three pieces what I can do now is I can range select all of those and press X and all of those are now crossfaded let's say I did another another track and I'm gonna mute this one and I'm gonna record something else so I'm gonna re oh yeah I don't want to start over there that I want to start at the beginning so I'm gonna record a wee bit more 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 and so on 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 oh you guys can't see this budge sorry about that so basically let's undo all of that let's undo Let's record, let's record, let's record, let's record, let's record. And uh, we'll just keep going, we'll keep going, we'll keep going. Keep Damn it, I wonder what happened there. My microphone. mic is muted, no BS. Uh, and we'll make it sound Yeah, I don't know why that happened. 
and all, of all right that. No, so uh that. you could probably hear what i was doing in studio one anyway so all i did there was in the first take the first channel um no it was not you if some somehow i must have triggered a keyboard shortcut that muted my mic sorry about that um let's see so um i'm gonna cut in some different places so i've cut all of these in slightly different places if i play both of these together it's gonna sound weird Let's record, let's record, record some let's more. Record, let's record, let's record. Can you guys not hear me? Uh, we'll just keep going, we'll keep going, we'll keep going. Keep Damn it, I wonder what happened there. My microphone. microphone. Alright, there we go. <laughs> Bit of cacophony there. Right, let's range select all of those. And then let's press X. And all of those are cross-faded. So, I could do this with all events. So if I had like 500 channels of audio all chopped up to Hades, and I suddenly realized, hey, I've been doing all of this, and I've forgotten to crossfade everything. You can just do Control or Command A, select everything in your song, and press X, and everything will be crossfaded all at once. So that's how that works. And that that's basically how it was explained to me by um, the guys at PSL, because I wasn't entirely sure what it meant in the guide when when they talked about this, it was like, hang on a minute, isn't this something we've already been, you know, able to do for a while? And so this is how it was explained to me. Um, that basically you can now select all events. Uh, you can chop them all up to Hades. Let's go, and, let's go and grab some more. Let's go and grab some uh, weird and wacky loops. So let's go and grab that. And you know what? We'll just, we'll just duplicate, uh, we'll just drop that volume down and then we'll just uh, duplicate that a few times then we'll go grab something else we'll go grab this we'll reduce the volume there too and then we'll duplicate all of those as well and then what we'll do is we'll go oh hang on a minute I forgot to crossfade all of those there done so it's as simple as that um, and then, like I said, you can range select all of those and you can crossfade them. But they're already crossfaded. We already did it. Um, so let's get rid of all of this. Let's remove selected tracks. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to grab some drum loops. Uh, Let's grab all of these. So I'm going to select the first, Alt Shift, select the last. And I'm going to bring all of those in. And then we're going to cut those down in volume. And then we're going to duplicate those three times. All right. So we got all of that right there. And I'm going to. Reduce these down in size so we can see all of them. And you can and you can of course stretch the cross phase to expand the phase. Yes, of course you can. You can you can set them to whatever you want. So let's now get rid of this instrument as well. We track an instrument, so everything should now just bump up. There we go. So what we can do is we can do control A and we can do cross fade. And then I can zoom in and I can grab all of these crossfades. And as you can see, all of those have changed. See how all of those crossfades are automatically changing? So I can set them however much I want them. So this is very, very cool. Very, very useful feature.
All right. Uh, Brett says, can you then combine the events after the crossfade? What, you mean um, bounce them? Yeah, you can, of course, bounce them. And the, all, all the fades will bounce as well. So, you know, I can go Command A or Control A and then Command or Control B and it bounces them all. And all those crossfades that I did are in there. You just don't see them anymore, but they have been rendered to the audio. They've been bounced to the audio, but all of those crossfades are actually there. It's just the actual crossfade is gone now because the it's been done in the audio, so it's no longer required. Uh, so Tony says, isn't doing command plus B almost the same as a crossfade? No, command plus B bounces the event. It does not do crossfades. Okay, the X button does crossfades. So, yes, yeah, so I basically touched on this very, very slightly in my overview video. Probably didn't really do it a whole lot of justice, which is why there are some comments where people are saying, Hey, you've been able to crossfade for, for like 10 years. And I'm just like, you kind of missed the point. The point is now that you can kind of, um, you can crossfade all your events with one finger press and you can adjust your crossfades to whatever in one move. That's the difference. You couldn't do that before. Um, so yeah, so whilst crossfading has been around and pressing the X button has been around for a long time, certainly has, but doing this across a whole range and then being able to custom move the crossfade to whatever you want it to be, that's new. Good question though. And by the way, you can, you can press this heart button as much as you like, or you can celebrate, or you can be astonished at that. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> um, I've only just started seeing that little um, emoji icon, by the way. Um, I think somebody basically said, how do you get rid of this? You don't. It's actually a new feature. It's a new feature in chat that uh, YouTube added to uh, chat in live streams, basically so that you can go, hey, I'm loving what's going on in this stream, or I totally agree, or... Hey, let's celebrate this thing that we're all talking about. So it just gives you guys an extra layer of interaction. So you don't have to type. You can actually just spam your mouse button on something you think is good. So Tony says one, one X marks the whole spot. Yeah. When you've got a range of selected events, like I just showed and you press X, all of those events will crossfade in an instant. Okay, so there you go. That is how that works. And we've got about eight minutes left, so I'm going to quickly go up and see if I have missed the question that Keith was going to ask us. Uh, oh, John Haythwaite says, did they make any updates to the show page? No, not yet. There are no updates to the show page in this release. There may be in the future. Who knows? I'm not at liberty to say so. Uh, let's see what else is there. Yeah. Oh, you sent it in an email. Okay. Let me, let me go grab that email. Uh, okay. Short version. Here we go. Uh, I have a lot of difficulty writing short songs, says Keith. I find it difficult to make abrupt changes to indicate a move from, say, verse to chorus. My brain says, hey, oh, maybe I need a 16-bar pre-chorus, when in fact I don't. Question is, how do you, that's me, know where to give your song a haircut? Basically, when to kind of cut the dross from your song. The best way to know when to cut dross from your song is listen to it. Take a couple of days off after you've started, after you've finished recording. Uh, and you, you basically are saying, great, I'm done with the recording phase of the song. Put it away. Don't listen to it for at least 48 hours. And then 
first thing in the morning, ideally, when you are nice and fresh and awake and alert and your ears are fresh and awake and alert and you have a strong sense of objectivity, then open up that song, sit at the back of your room. So you cannot touch your computer keyboard, you cannot touch any control surfaces or anything to do with Studio One whatsoever. You can't even press the stop button. You have to listen to the song from start to finish. No pen, no paper, just sit and listen. But you don't sit passively and listen. You are actively listening. You are listening for overall engagement. That's the first thing you listen to. On the first pass through the song, you listen to overall engagement. Am I engaged with this song from the moment it starts to the moment it finishes? Because if, if you're not completely engaged with the song from the start to the end, then your audience won't be. Your audience will be less engaged than you are. Okay? So you have to set yourself a higher standard because your audience is going to set a higher standard. Okay? So what you need to do is listen actively through the first pass all the way through the song without pressing stop. And then you listen again. This time with notepad and pen. And this time you're listening for the parts of the song where you are disengaged. Just mark them down. Mark them down where they are in the song. And that's all you do. And you listen all the way through. That's the only thing you're allowed to do. The next listen through. This time you're going to make you're going to pay extra special attention to those points where you are less engaged and you're going to listen critically. Okay, why was I less engaged? Was this bit too long? Was this bit too short? Did I not really give a big enough kind of a build up into that section or was the build up great, but then the chorus was a little bit of a lame, a little bit of a damp squib. So you're listening for those things. Make note of those. Again, going all the way through from start to finish. Then the next listen through. Again, listening all the way through from start to finish. You're paying attention to those things once again, but this time you're going, okay, now what specifically caused the first thing that I listened to on the previous listen through? So what was it? Identify exactly what it is in music, musical terms and in, uh, you know, terms of what what the recorded material was, try and zero in on the specifics of what it is that caused you to lose engagement. And then the next listen through, you are allowed to sit near your computer, to sit in your sweet spot. And this time you are allowed to do some editing. You go to those points in the song that you made notes about and you listen to just a bit before and just a bit after. And that's the only bit that you listen to. So this is your first error spot, your first spot in the song that you want to fix. And this time you're just listening to that bit in isolation and you're going, OK, do I still agree with what I wrote down earlier? And if you still agree with it, go fix those things. Move on to the next one. Do exactly the same. Only listen to that affected area. And do that for all the affected areas that you noted down. And then you repeat the whole process. Okay? You repeat the whole process again. This time you're going back to the back of the room. You have fixed those things that you noted. And this time you're listening broad again, overall context again. Am I still engaged? Is my engagement better? Do I have fewer things on this? listen through. So the idea is you repeat this process several times until you get to a point where you're sitting at the back of your room and you've listened through to the whole song and you have nothing to write down because you are completely engaged from start to finish of your song. When you've got to that point, you are done. There is no more arranging to do. There is no more editing to do. There is no more re-recording to do. The recording Editing, arranging, production phase is done. You can now move on to mixing. Now, when you get into mixing, you may find as you're mixing the song, you go, you know what? 
there's still a certain something missing from this song. And you may decide, hey, maybe when we get to that chorus, it just needs some high octave strings and a, and a kind of whole tone counter melody thing that would just add some shimmer and some sparkle. Add that in. You can still, when you're in a mixing phase, still add little bits of ear candy if you think they are necessary. But only do it if you think they're necessary. And then go back to mixing. And then when you get to the end of the mixing phase and you go, you know what, actually, I am starting to really dig this mix. It sounds great. And you're starting to, you know, bob your head. You're starting to really get into the music. You know you've nailed your mix. Then you do a variation of what you did at the end of the recording process. And this time you're listening specifically for things in the mix that offend you. And you repeat that process until there's nothing that bothers you about the mix. Then you go put it away again and you don't listen to the song for two more days. And then you come back and you have one last objective listen through and you see if you note anything down. If you note anything down, you go fix it. If there's nothing to note down, you have nailed it. You can go master the song or you can send it off to somebody to master. Um, and that is how I do it. I, that's the process I apply to every song. It does mean that it can be a little bit lengthy, but it, it means I have checks and balances. I have a proper quality assurance, quality control system all the way through the recording, editing, arranging and production phase. All of that has a proper quality control. So by the time I get to mixing, the song is already outstanding. So that's going to make the whole mix a whole lot easier to start with. And the mix should be, the mixing process should be really, really short because the song is banging. OK, so I hope, Keith, that that really helps you um, a lot. Um, because things like, does this song need a 16 bar pre-chorus or does it just need a little four bar pre-chorus? Or not those are really really important arranging decisions and sometimes the answer is yes you want to build up the tension you want to build it up build it up build it up build it up and drop your customer your listener from a very high height into this glorious chorus or you want to suddenly very quickly hit them with the chorus it depends on the context of the song sometimes you want a nice long build up sometimes you don't sometimes you just want to jump straight into the chorus you don't need a pre-chorus. Okay, so uh, those are th those are the things that I I live by. Uh, and he says, sounds like a plan. Good, I'm glad that helped. So Tony says, when I was married, my ex-wife would say that song is too long. It gets boring right about the 13 minute mark. <laughs> yeah, there's you know. I'm all for long songs, actually, especially if there's a lot of improvisational material within the song. But, like you said, if the improvisation starts getting a little bit boring and the, the people that are involved in the improvisation are becoming a little bit less engaged, then it can become a little bit shit very quickly. So, no kind of when to stop. Always know when to stop, and that's actually hard to do, especially if you really enjoy improvising. I love improvising. I improvise all the time. Um, for, a, uh, for a whole summer season um, at a jazz festival, um, a band I worked with, they weren't my band, but they're a band I worked with, um, we played the whole season. We were there for like four weeks. And we played five nights a week for four weeks. It was like a great earner. It was wonderful. It was a glorious amount of money. But when we were there, uh, we decided what we were going to do for this for this um, show that we were doing was we would totally improvise for the entire show. The show would be split into two into two set two sections. So uh, a first set an intermission, then a second set. Um, and we did this five nights a week. I think it was five nights, might have been six, I can't remember. Five or six nights a week for the, for the four weeks that we were there. And we did this every night. And it was entirely improvised music from start to finish. 
Nobody had any idea what we were going to play when we walked onto the stage. We walked onto the stage, we sat down at our instruments, and somebody started something, and off we went. Did we play the same thing for the whole first set? Did we just play one thing for the whole set? No. Sometimes we did. Sometimes we didn't. Sometimes it would be very clear to everybody that this particular idea has come to an end, so we stop. We allow the audience to respond and the audience to engage with us. We banter a little bit with the audience and then somebody would start the next thing. And that was how it would go. We would do this, we would do maybe, I don't know, somewhere between five and ten songs, if you like, within the set, if you could call it that. But it, everything was purely improvised. There was no preconceived chord changes. There was no stylistic ideas no pre-worked out melodies, no nothing. It was pure group improvisation. And we did that for four weeks. And I tell you, it turned me from a mediocre, fairly good improviser into a really, really, really good improviser. And I went from being an okay listener to my ears were so attuned to the other guys in the band that I could anticipate what somebody else was going to play before they played it. This is how in, in tune we were. So by the time we got to that last week, we walked onto the stage, and although there was no preconceived ideas, I could anticipate what other people were doing. They could anticipate what we were doing. We could finish each other's musical sentences. And so the quality of the music exponentially got better over the course of the four weeks. It was awesome. It was some of the best music I ever played. Um, nobody recorded it. It... We specifically asked nobody to record it because we wanted that music to live in that moment every night. So every night it would be different. Um, and every night that music would be raw, live, in that moment, and then gone. So it was pure jazz in that respect. Um, and some nights it would get a little bit drum and bassy at points. Um, some nights it would get, you know, really very, very modern and very, very kind of tonally very flexible. And sometimes it would be very, very kind of diatonic and almost a little bit Bach-like. Um, it was wonderful. Uh, and there was a point there <laughs> that I have since lost. But there, there you go. Um, I, I hope you got something out of that. Uh, let's see... I'm trying to figure out what, what kind of is going on here that I've missed. Um, Brett says, uh, what would have caused the new Zoom icon not to be included in the Complete View toolbar? How do I remedy this? Brett, yes. Okay, we're going to overrun with this show, but we overran, we overran last show, and it's fine. It's okay. I don't mind. Um, I think in your case... You need to check what version of Studio One you are actually running and that you have actually activated on your computer and is actually running right now. Because if you don't, if you think you are running Studio One 6.2 and you don't see this, this icon here, I mean, maybe it looks like that for you. Maybe it looks like that for you. And maybe not like that for you. But if you don't see this, if you don't see this button here in the toolbar, either it's because in Customize, Auto Zoom has been turned off. Okay, so if you are in Complete, then it should be there. If you are in Audio Editing, it should also be there. Um, but if you're in Basic, it's still there. If you're a minimal, it's still there. All right. So it looks like even if you are in minimal mode, it is still there. So right click. Make sure that the auto zoom box is checked. If it's not, then it's not going to show up. You're not going to see it. It's hidden from view. So make sure this box is checked. See, I can make it go away and come back at will. Okay. So, Brett, this is the first thing you need to look at. Actually, no. That, that was the second thing you need to look at. First thing you need to look at 
is help about Studio One and check this build number, Studio One 6.2.0, and make sure this says Studio One Professional. Okay? Check this first. If it does say Studio One 6.2.0-94620, built July 14th, 2023, and it says Studio One Professional, then you are running the correct version of Studio One. All right? That's the first thing to check. Next thing to check. Check this customize area. Make sure the auto scroll button is is checked. Not auto scroll, auto zoom. <laughs> there we go. Make sure this guy is enabled. If it's not enabled, you won't see it. And that's it. The only other solution is that you if all of those check out, if all of those things are correct, then the only thing that could possibly be wrong. So you're running Studio One 6.2, you're running Studio One Professional, and you've checked the customize box, and the auto zoom box is in fact checked, so it but it still doesn't show up. Then the next thing to check is your screen resolution. If your screen resolution is not set correctly, sometimes some of these things can disappear. All right, so make sure your screen resolution is set correctly. But, however, if all of that checks out, don't panic. You still have one other card to play. Your other card to play is check that your graphics card drivers are up to date. If they're not, uninstall them, reinstall them. Also, uninstall and reinstall Studio One. Okay, also go trash your... Uh, settings files and that and let studio one write a whole bunch of new settings files when you launch studio one again do all of those things and if after all of those things you still don't see the um auto zoom button make a technical support ticket okay from your my.personas.com account so the way you do that for those of you that don't know how to do that go studio one support and then you go open tickets and then you click this blue plus sign here yes yeah, blue for me it might be red for you if you use if you're using the dark mode click this guy create this ticket give us as much information as you can give us screenshots make a short video that's like 30 seconds long add that to your ticket as well give us loads of details and the tech support guys will work out what the problem is because they rock so brett i hope that that helps you mate but from there we are actually done because we've we've run over but i still wanted to i wanted to make sure brett that we covered that because i promised you that we would we would see if we could work that one out so um we have reached the end of the show folks in fact we're 12 minutes over the end of the show um just bob has one last question he says what is the add bus feature in macros it's basically what it is it just adds a bus so if you have if you've packed a folder you can uh you can just by using the macro not only pack the folder but add a um, bus to it. Lucas did a great video on that so go check out Lucas's video and he shows you how to do that. Check that out. Brett is going to check the screen resolution. Don't just check the screen resolution, check all those other things as well. Make sure that no stone is unturned. Okay and then if after checking screen resolution you still don't see it, create that support ticket, give all of those details, screenshots, the works give us as much detail as as you can and the tech support guys will get to that and they'll give you a solution um radio tuck from it says i love the auto zoom so do i i have it set to full auto zoom and it's great i love it um i wish we'd had it years ago but we didn't anyway that's the end of the show folks i will see you on sunday for sunday night live and uh we will return to normal service so it will be a normal Sunday Night Live. It won't be as um, a Studio One 6.2 special. But if you still got Studio One 6.2 questions, you can still ask them. Okay, it's just it's not going to be specifically the focus. Um, 
Okay, but if you've got Studio One Plus questions, you've got Studio One 6.2 questions, like we have just now, kind of right at the end of the show, it's fine, hold on to them, save them for Sunday, and we'll get to them then as well. Um, but that's it. End of show. I'll see you on Sunday. I love you all. You guys rock. You are the absolute best. Best audience a guy could ever hope for. And I'll see you Sunday. Good night, everybody.